Hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today. I'm Allison Schaff with Smashfly. We're so glad you could tune in as we talk about strategies for building a top-notch referral program. Before we get started, I just wanted to run through a few things. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording and slides will be sent to you following the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties today, we encourage you to call ReadyTalk support at 800-843-9166. Don't worry about writing that down now. I'll be typing this number into the chat window for your reference. We love questions, so feel free to submit any questions you have throughout the webinar using the chat box. We'll leave about 10 minutes for Q&A with our speakers at the end. Also, don't forget to say hi on Twitter. We'll be live tweeting throughout the presentation, and we'd love to hear from you. Join the conversation with hashtag HappyHires, and feel free to tag Smashfly at Smashfly and Glassdoor at GD for employers. I'm very excited to welcome our two speakers today. Josh Swain is Content Manager here at Smashfly. He's passionate about empowering talent acquisition teams to transform how, where, when, and why they build relationships with the right people. Mallory Brown is Content Marketing Manager at Glassdoor, where she gets daily inspiration from helping employers, both big and small, recruit better and foster cultures where employees can truly thrive. So now, without further ado, let's get to the good stuff. Mallory, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Allie, and um, thanks, Josh, for being here too, and I want to thank everybody on the line as well. I know it's not easy to take an hour out of your day to attend a webcast, so we really appreciate your time, and hopefully you find a lot of value in what we're going to share today. Um, and lastly, happy International Women's Day. I know it was yesterday, but I just had to throw that out there. Um, really exciting to be um, a woman today, and uh, just wanted to congratulate everybody else on the line. <laughs> um, so as Ali said, I'm the content manager at Glassdoor, and I'm excited to be he here and speaking alongside Josh because I think we're both going to bring different perspectives to the table when we talk about referrals. Um, so to briefly run you through today's agenda, we're going to start with a little bit of information about where the talent landscape is today. We'll then transition into explaining a bit about why referrals are such a proven channel for employer branding and recruiting. We'll get into the meat of the presentation, which is the nine steps to help you create a really strategic and effective employee referral program. Um, we'll wrap up with some key takeaways, and then we're going to finish with some Q&A, which is my favorite part, um, with all of you fine folks on the line. So if you do have questions, don't be shy please go ahead and enter them into the questions pane. Okay, to set the stage today, we need to talk a bit about how people actually make decisions about where to work today. And we all know there's so much information out there today in this digital age, and candidates want to make informed decisions around employment. They're treating job search as a highly critical decision, so they want to read reviews. They want to conduct research and hear from employees on the inside before making a decision. You know, they're going to be investing personally in where they work. Um, and that speaks really perfectly to why referrals are such a proven channel and one that will become increasingly important as the talent climate continues to shift and we see new generations entering the workforce. So since the job experience has changed, the way that we have to successfully hire has also changed. Um, we must continue to evolve alongside our candidate because job seekers behave more like consumers today. Um, they're spending more time carefully considering their choices, and that's actually a good thing for all of us. Um, it's better for the candidate long term. It's going to mean that they have a more successful career and that they stay longer they're more productive and more invested in the company. Um, and it also means great things for you as an organization in the long term. So the ability for a job seeker to have a truly honest understanding of what a role will be like before accepting it, this is a good thing. 
So today's digital landscape not only encourages research, it also fosters social connections. Social networking and texting and having email available you know, in your hand at all times with your friends, your family, acquaintances, current and former colleagues, and even maybe people that you've never met that you're connected with on social media. Um, all of this is playing into the climate today. And people rank referrals as being really important in their job search. This all comes down to trust for me when I think about it. Um, we're social beings. We love real storytelling. And now we have the luxury of being able to connect with others at the click of a button and really kind of crowdsource data to make decisions. Um, because peer opinion proves out that our decisions are sound, and we get to have those in real time now. Now, if you're feeling the heat of the moment in the hiring space, you're definitely not alone. On top of all of this digital stuff that's really disrupting hiring, um, we know that unemployment is extremely low. Uh, 2016 saw the lowest unemployment rate since 2007. And there's a lot of research to support that. Um, Burson by Deloitte actually says that employees you know, are far more likely to look for new jobs when un unemployment rates go down. Um, Josh, I'd love to know your thoughts here as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but there's, there's really just a confluence of trends that I think are constricting the labor market uh, as a whole. Um, you know, I think everybody's probably sick of hearing about this, but we've got baby boomers that are retiring at you know, ridiculous rates at this point. Um, the gig economy is certainly affecting how people view work and think about work in general. Um, I read a stat the other day from CEB that 90% of the S&P 100 are recruiting for the same 21 roles. So you've got kind of this specialization that is focused on specific types of talent and specific job categories. Um, so as companies are kind of fighting over that, that same small pool of talent, um, it, you know, it's, it's really kind of adding up to this perfect storm where um, finding or kind of hiring that talent is, has become incredibly difficult. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and to your point, this is not new news to anybody on the line, but I think having data to back this up is really helpful and important if you are trying to justify more investment in referral programs um, or build one from scratch. Um, hopefully, you know, some of this data can really help you make that case. Um, we know that you know, unemployment is high, so I'm sorry, is low. <laughs> so everyone who wants to work basically can at this time. Um, and tight labor market or not, I think it's really important to um, kind of think about what you were mentioning earlier, Josh, which is that you know, this new generation of workers is entering the workforce, and there's tons of discussion being had right now around Gen Z. Um, and the implications for hiring them. So their habits and their trends, the technologies they're using, their overall kind of skepticism for brands, and they're heavily reliant on peer opinion. So I see referrals as becoming even more powerful um, and kind of seeing people get more creative with them over time. Yeah, and Mallory, just to touch on that too. So our team has kind of started referring to what we're calling Generation Y, and that's W-H-Y. But that, I think encapsulates um, everybody in the talent pool. So um, I think these trends, it's easy to kind of focus on, on millennials kind of rethinking what work means to them. But I think ultimately people um, as a whole care about or care more now today about uh, why they work somewhere, how they work, and what their workplace gives them. Um, so I think that too just, you know, it, this really applies across the board. It's not just uh, the younger generation. 100% agree with that. Um, and that point you just made is reflected in the fact that interview processes are growing in length. Um, people are being more careful with that decision. Um, and so it's, it's also easier to lose out on candidates um, if they're being swayed by your competitors, um, if your interview process isn't as you know, seamless perhaps as you know, another company. Um, so we need to be really savvy as recruiters and as talent acquisition professionals on how we're attracting talent. And 
kind of growing your referral program can make a difference for you um, in speeding up your time to hire and producing really high quality hires. All right, so yeah, have, I guess I'll, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's per, I think it's a perfect setup really for you know the question probably everybody came here to answer, which is why referrals are essential for employer branding and recruiting in general. Um, I think before we get into this this section of the the presentation here, though, it's probably worth pointing out that referrals on their own aren't really what we're we're driving toward or what companies should be driving toward. It's it's really the right referrals. Um, so it's getting it's getting people into your company. Um, that kind of fill the needs that you need to, to fill, also fit with your culture. Um, and, and I think getting those types of referrals takes a different type of approach and a different type of strategy. Um, so we're, we're kind of going to work toward that direction and talk about how you can build that type of referral program. But I think it's important to kind of uh, present that as a caveat before we, we dive into the rest here. So in terms of the value of a referral program, I think that's pretty obvious. I think most people understand that a referred employee, and, and Mallory covered this earlier, a referred employee generally um, will stay longer, be happier, uh, and, and you know, ultimately refer other employees your way. Um, one of our customers that we work with uh, saw a 152% increase in track referrals in one year. Um, and I think not coincidentally, that also led to 24% more roles filled and a 48% reduction in cost per hire. Um, now, I don't think those numbers are perfectly correlated, and obviously there's different factors influencing them, but I think it's it's safe to say that referrals can have an impact on your core recruiting metrics and um, the business's bottom line. So I think overall referrals too are essential to your recruitment marketing strategy. Um, Glassdoor's research shows that 49% of Glassdoor users would recommend their employers to a friend. The challenge is that uh, we've got 50% about of these users who would recommend their employers to a friend. The question is how do they do that? Um, are they doing that, and how can you kind of get them to, to be more willing and able to, to refer the right types of people? Um, you know, ultimately, uh, referred employees, this goes back to what Mallory touched on earlier, referred employees also stay longer because they join the company with a person they already know and trust. Uh, and when they come into the company, they're better informed about the role that they're taking on and who the company is, um, why it exists, what it's driving toward all these factors that ultimately allow for, for somebody to feel like they fit in better uh, with, with the company. So again, just uh, to touch on some, some metrics that I think speak to the value, referral hires um, have longer, uh, longer tenures with the company generally and, and greater satisfaction. Um, the job bite index shows that 46% stay for over a year, 45% stay for over two years and 46% stay for over three years. I think you know, if we look at hiring metrics in general and retention metrics, I think those, those stand out um, and really create a, a pretty compelling argument for, for uh, why a referral program makes a lot of sense. Um, so again, I think just to sum up, the, the stats don't lie. And I think in, intuitively um, and anecdotally, most of us understand that referrals um, lead to uh, better hires, happier hires, people who stay longer. Um, again, the research shows that referrals are five times more likely to be hired than candidates sourced via other tactics. Um, and they're also the number one source of diversity hires. So in terms of, um, this goes back, I think, to um, referrals being, being kind of strategic more than they are tactical. Um, if, you, if, you do your, if you structure your referral program right, you can ultimately drive toward a specific goal or outcome. So you can tie your referral campaigns and your referral strategy to your broader recruiting and, and talent acquisition goals. Mal, do you have anything to add there? I think I'm, I'm passing back to you here. Yeah. Um, just one thing I wanted to note, you showed that stat a little earlier on kind of the average percentage of Glassdoor users who would recommend their company to a friend. Um, so I just wanted to add, I think that's a really kind of telling metric, so I encourage everybody to look at that rating on their Glassdoor company profile. Look at percentage um, of employees that would recommend your company to a friend. It's just kind of a nice way to gut check, and it's a good key indicator that if you don't have a really great program in place already, um, that should tell you, you know, do you have a number of people willing to stand behind your brand and really go out on a limb for you to reach out to their networks. 
um, I think that data is, you know, is useful. Um, again, just because, you know, we know that referred employees really believe in, in the values of the company, um, in, in the people, in the job, um, in engaging those people that will share their story and paint that realistic picture is truly important. I myself was a referred candidate actually um, two and a half years ago at Glassdoor. My best friend um, kind of threw my hat in the ring and I had never really considered a career in, in the space that Glassdoor is in, but she sold me with kind of the story that she told me and here we are today. So, so moving on, um, let's really get into the meat of the presentation which is you know, how you can turn your strongest employees into brand advocates. And just a quick backstory on this presentation and really the ebook this whole presentation was based on. Um, the reason Glassdoor and Smashfly are joining forces here um, is because we are going to bring different perspectives to the referral program and building that out. Um, and, and as Josh, Josh mentioned earlier, you know, we're fully aware most, most companies have some sort of program in place, but as he said, it's probably not optimized um, for kind of the climate we're in and you know, set up for success to really hire those specific hard to fill roles that we're all kind of fighting for. Um, so just keep in mind, if you already have one in place, these are some ways you can perhaps maybe rethink or revamp your current efforts and you know, create a really simple, structured, easy to measure, and effective campaign um, that will work in the long term. Okay, so first and foremost, make sure that your people know your story and your mission and what makes you great like the back of, of their hand. Um, if you are selling a product, um, you're selling a brand, and the same goes for selling a job. Um, it's a talent brand. And that brand can and should have a consistent, compelling story that your employees can kind of recite by heart. They're going to be more willing to refer people if they can confidently speak to why your company is great. So make sure that you're reinforcing your employee value proposition everywhere that you can. And a great example of this um, is from Salesforce. We recently had Jennifer Johnston from Salesforce speak at our Best Places to Work Roadshow. Um, and she talked a lot about how Salesforce has really built its EVP around the spirit of ohana, um, which in Hawaiian culture really means a sense of family, the idea that people are bound together, they take care of each other. Um, so there's an emotional element there. It really guides the way that their employees interact with each other and with the outside world. Um, so make sure that you're embracing your employer brand, you're fostering that EVP um, throughout the way that um, you recruit, um, the candidate experience, and you know, employees' day-to-day -day life. Tip number two, get leaders to support you and hiring managers to buy into this. Um, the success of your program is really contingent upon their support. And your CEO can have a really big role in encouraging your program. I know here at Glassdoor, our CEO Robert Holman talks about our referral program constantly at company all hands meetings um, and kind of wherever he can because he knows our people are our biggest asset. And if we really want to move the company forward, we need to have great people to do that. Um, so make sure you're looping in your company leaders and explaining to them why their support is so necessary here. And always connect it back to kind of company initiatives and goals. Uh, once people have that understanding, I think they're, even if you don't have you know, kind of sexy um, incentives in place, I think people really get that and they want to be a part of a great company and so they're going to be more willing to participate. Data, data, data. Um, hopefully everybody on the line has access to some sort of data that can you know, help them get leadership buy-in. But if you don't, um, you know, send us a note in the questions pane on how to get it um, and use this presentation as an asset as well. If you are a Glassdoor client, you can leverage some of the analytics in your employer center. 
And you can see the percentage of applicants that came in via a referral. Um, you can also tap your recruiters if you don't have you know, tech in place to kind of manually sort through some of this information and talk to them about the quality and quantity of referrals they're getting um, to see if you know, this will be an effective platform for you and kind of where you need to do some work. Establishing your program incentives and guidelines is also, I think, crucial. Structure is the path to success here. You need to be extremely transparent with employees about how your referral program is structured. If it does involve incentives, especially, and that includes when and how you're going to distribute those referral bonuses. So you can actually have incentives very you know, by type of position, if it's a super hard to fill role, or if it's part time, if it's customer facing, um, you know, those incentives can vary. And you can also test out gamification approaches, you know, rewarding people in different ways um, and make referring part of your company culture. So get creative with it. Um, you can also offer donations as a cool way to go if you know, the spirit of your company is really to give back to your communities. Um, maybe give your employees the option to make a donation to their favorite cause. You can also offer things like gifts, uh, prizes, or bonus vacation days um, to the employee who, you know, kind of is buying into the referral program. Yeah, and Mallory, just to touch on that too, I think, I think the really important thing to think about with incentives is that they're, they should really be viewed as kind of a bonus um, not the driving force of a referral. I think the problem with putting incentives front and center and really focusing on that as the driver of your referrals is that it, it puts, um, I think, misplaced emphasis on volume over quality. Um, ultimately, if you're doing a good job telling your story and, and kind of uh, giving your employees a compelling reason to refer someone, then the money will be kind of secondary. The, the reward or incentive will be sec secondary. Uh, it'll be a nice to have versus what really motivates someone to to refer. That's a great point, and I think people intrinsically want to be great. They want to work at a great company, and they want to be surrounded by talented, driven people. So, I think innately, uh, you know, as as long as people understand how the program ties back to the company's overall objectives and and how you know adding people who can add value to your culture can move the needle for the company. I totally agree. I think that's really kind of the most important thing here. So I can't stress enough simplifying this process as well is going to be um, a major key to success. It needs to be easy for employees to make referrals. It needs to be easy for you to track referred candidates. Um, and you know, allocate those referral bonuses appropriately if they do exist. So make sure that your procedures are kind of up to standards today. Um, if you can make them mobile friendly, please like, do so. That's huge. You know, everyone's spending time on their phone. Um, if you can require the most minimal amount of information, um, that's also ideal. This is a big part of marketing as well. Um, the less information you can solicit from somebody um, to kind of get them into your system and start warming them up, uh, the better. And then make sure that you're communicating properly with your employees. If they refer a candidate, they should know kind of what the status of that referral is. If they're left in the dark, they're not going to see the value in doing it. So make sure that you're staying in touch and kind of closing the loop not only with the referred candidate, but the employee who actually helped to bring that person to your attention. And yeah, uh, JD, I'm going to hang, hand it off to you. All right, sounds good. So I think, I think that naturally leads into this, and, and obviously we are technology companies. Um, so you know, it might seem subjective that we're, we're including some bit about technology in here, but I really think this is an important piece of it. When you think about the context of the history of how most referral programs have been managed or probably are managed today, and that's through the ATS. Um, we've got, uh, I think we've got data coming later in the presentation about how many companies use their ATS for the referral program. 
but data from Career Cross, uh, Crossroads uh, shows that 75% of companies are less than satisfied with their ATS referral service. Now, if you think about like why that is and why an ATS is an ineffective um, technology for managing a referral program, it's pretty simple. It was never built really to, to segment or to target communications. It wasn't built to nurture um, contacts or referrals over time. Um, it really was, it was built to drive people to application and get them into the process. Um, and, and with referrals, that you know, can be somewhat ineffective, you know, especially if you're targeting passive talent, um, people who may or may not be interested, and ready or interested or ready to apply right now. What do you do with them if they're unwilling to apply? Um, and I've heard the argument before that um, if someone isn't ready to apply or unwilling to apply, then we don't want them. And I think if you put that in context of consumer marketing, um, I think we'd, we'd all see kind of how uh, foolish that can be, uh, for lack of a better term, and not to be harsh. But um, if you think about a company like Tesla, um, and a customer was referred to Tesla, but that customer wasn't ready to buy right now, you wouldn't see Tesla just shun that, that customer and, and never communicate with them again or, or you know, cut off communications or, or not accept the referral. What they would do is take that referral, engage with that potential customer, refer or nurture them over time, and really kind of work on building that relationship so that when that customer was ready to buy, their first choice really would be Tesla or would be whatever brand was, was kind of building that relationship with them. Um, I think in a lot of ways, referral programs are the same, same way. We need to think about how you can take these contacts in. If they're ready to apply and they're ready to, to get into your, your hiring process, that's wonderful, and obviously you want to drive them to do that. But if they're not, what are you going to do with those people and how are you going to manage them? Um, that's where I think going back to what a referral program really should be, in a perfect world, it's a high-touch strategic uh, initiative. It's, it's something that you um, can apply to your broader recruiting and talent acquisition goals. So if you have an, an initiative around diversity, you should have a program uh, or a campaign specific, uh, specifically created in your referral program that's targeted toward that goal. Um, an ATS, quite frankly, is just not equipped for that. Um, it was never built for that. And, and that's really why referral technologies have sprouted up and, and why um, a lot of companies are kind of moving in that direction. Um, that being said, and this will be the last thing I, I kind of say on this topic here, um, I think when you think about the data that's created from your referral program and the nurturing process that goes on, it's also important that that is connected not just to your ATS, but to every other part of your recruiting strategy. So referrals can't just be some siloed uh, initiative or strategy. It really needs to be part of this bigger recruitment marketing initiative or recruitment marketing strategy that you've, that you've created. That way data can be shared um, across all channels and, and tactics, and you can really get a better picture of what role referrals are playing in helping you hire the right people. Back to you, uh, Mallory, I think here. Thank you. Um, great analogy with the, the Tesla example. Um, yeah, a lot of marketing apl uh, tactics apply, and, and you're right that this is part of a larger recruitment marketing strategy. Um, and on that note, like you said, this can't be a siloed activity. This can't be a one-off campaign that you do. Um, constant and regular communication around your referral program is going to be key. And Make sure you're driving home the organizational benefits, once again, of, of the program. Um, otherwise, you know, people who may not be naturally inclined to network and reach out to their acquaintances and friends and family, um, they're not going to do it unless they really understand the underlying benefits to the entire organization. Um, so make sure you're communicating that importance, reminding people of whatever incentives do exist if you have them. Um, and so the right way to do this is to really have a fully scoped out communications plan that includes things like hopefully automated um, emails that you can do you know, if you do have a great tool in place. Um, personalized emails. If you're, for instance, if you are struggling to hire within a specific job group, um, you know, you should be personalizing that experience and making sure that you're speaking to the audience you're trying to um, have help you out with this referral program um, in a way that 
makes sense to them in a way that empowers them and um, makes them truly understand the importance. And then hopefully you can also start sharing some referral success stories with your organization. Um, again, we as humans, we gravitate toward great storytelling. So we want to know um, how a referral program is impacting the company at large. If we've brought on really amazing people through the referral program, let's highlight the work that they're doing now and how they're driving success for the company and how other employees can do the same. Um, you can also do other things like intranet updates and just make sure you're disseminating that information broadly, making it easy for people to access it. And then again, hiring managers and leaders at your company should be driving this home in their constant communications with their teams. Yeah, Mal, I think that's a great point too. I think um, when you think about the motivations for certain people and segments of your employee base or your, um, your, your network in general, so whether it's alumni, partners, vendors, whatever, all of those different groups of people will have different motivations for referring. They're going to want to refer at different uh, rates. They're going to have larger or smaller networks. So really you have to be able to target your communications to those people uh, and be able to create segmented or pipe, you know, basically pipelines of people um, that you can use and kind of tap into uh, for specific re referral campaigns. So um, it really comes down to when you think about personalization, it's not just kind of tweaking some email copy. It's having um, you know, a strategy for how you're going to engage these different personas um, within your referral structure, referral network. Thank you. And um, just a note, because I, I forgive me, but I keep seeing parallels between, you know, recruitment marketing and, you know, influencer marketing. So I just wanted to share a bit of a bit about what influencer marketing is and what influencer advertising means. Um, influencers today, when we talk about it in a marketing way, we mean people that have the ability to affect action. So what you're really doing when you're building out a referral program. Um, is they're mirroring influencer advertising. So in the same way that myself as a marketer, I lean on influencers or ambassadors for our brand to promote out the company's story, this is really how you should be leveraging your employees. Encourage them to be brand ambassadors so they're engaging with their endless connections of friends and colleagues and to Josh's point, um, maybe vendors they interact with, um, partner companies, you name it. Um, who doesn't love to feel influential and kind of a sense of purpose? People love that. So um, Josh, what else you know, in your mind do you think employers can do to get referrals right? Yeah, I mean I think um, – uh, yeah, exactly. I think transitioning to this slide, I think this is, um, this is really kind of spot on. If you think about um, – Let's use Mallory and myself as, as an example. Um, I've never worked at Glassdoor. Um, I've never applied to Glassdoor, but I know Glassdoor and I know the brand and I know what the company is all about. So if I had a friend who moved out to San Francisco, I think that's where you're headquartered, right, Mallory? That's right. Yeah, all right, good. So if I had a friend move out to San Francisco and I knew that you know I was perusing Glassdoor's uh, careers page or jobs page, and I saw an open opportunity that that person might be a fit for. I would absolutely refer them, um, and I'd refer them to, I'd maybe reach out to Mallory first and find the right person uh, to send them to, but, but that's a referral um, at its core, and I'm not an employee. I have no direct affiliation with Glassdoor, but there's an opportunity there for, for me to be part of that network, um, and that network really extends to, uh, as Mallory pointed out, vendors, partners, uh, fans of your brand, um, alumni from your company. Um, it could be customers too. So it's really, I, I think, the importance when, you, when we talk about referrals, it's not really employee referrals, although that's what we uh, tend to, to focus on. Um, there's this really broad network of, of potential referees um, that you can tap into. And that, that goes back again to being able to segment your communications and, and really target them to um, that, that broader network so that you know, when you're asking for a referral, you're asking in the right way at the right time with the right type of message. Um, and I really think that's, you know, that's core to this entire strategy. All right. Um, let me advance the slide here. 
So I think we've touched on this a little bit about um, how we measure the success of a referral program, but I think the key is can you measure it? If you don't have the ability to measure um, what success means or you don't really know what success looks like with a referral program, that should be a red flag. And I think it should tell you that you either lack the right process or you lack the right uh, technology to, to really be able to see um, all of your referral activity, where it's coming from, how it stacks up against your other um, recruiting and hiring initiatives or, or tactics, um, you know, what your success rate is with specific people who refer and networks who refer and pipelines who refer. Um, all of those things can and should be tracked and measured. Um, and if you're not able to, it's usually a sign that you either don't have the right technology um, or you don't have any technology at all. Uh, and ultimately, for the, the referral program to be successful, um, I think this, this level of intelligence or insight is pretty critical because um, if you can see what's working within your referral program and then how it stacks up maybe to your other initiatives and, and tactics, then you can kind of adjust accordingly and reinvest or, re or divert resources to places that really make sense that are, that are driving your hires. Um, this is a number that I talked about earlier. 53% of companies are using their ATS to manage their referral program, but 45% have little to, uh, little to no confidence in the method of tracking. Um, a big reason for that is um, the only point of contact with the ATS and the only point of tracking really is through apply. Um, but when you, can, when you can track activity, so every single touch point and every single point of outreach to a, to a potential candidate, uh, referred candidate, um, and then your referral sources as well, it just paints this much deeper, more vibrant picture about your, your recruiting and your hiring strategy and allows you to, to, to more appropriately um, focus your efforts. Uh, Mal, do you have anything to add there? Sorry, just wrapping my mind around everything you said. Um, yeah. Totally, totally agree. Um, I think you know, making sure you have confidence in the ways that you're tracking success is really important. Um, I know as a marketer, I can't make any decisions without data, um, and I, I know that's really hard when you don't have systems in place um, that make it easy and make it streamlined. So definitely getting help from a recruitment marketing platform. Um, in my mind, makes a lot of sense and saves a lot of time. Right. Yeah, and I think I think the key again here is um, the ATS plays an important role in in talent acquisition in general and your referral program. It's not to say the ATS doesn't serve a purpose; it certainly does. Um, but as companies are starting to implement technologies like a CRM, um, the referral program really needs to clear or cleanly integrate with that technology as well so that data can be shared between those two systems seamlessly and, and in a very kind of pure way. Um, otherwise, you're going to have uh, two systems or three systems that are butting heads and not really sharing um, data in a way that's, that's productive for the team. Yeah, disparate data is no one's friend. Nobody's friend. Hand. Nobody likes that. Um, so again, I think when you, when you have access to the right data and you are able to measure your activities and, and your strategy, you can use the analysis and the intelligence that that process creates um, to better predict uh, lead generation, where you should be diverting efforts. Um, you'll get a better idea of um, how your referral program and referral strategy stacks up to other sources of hire. Um, and uh, I think importantly too, this is, this is a point that I think gets forgotten, but you can track employee and user engagement within your referral program. So you'll be able to see um, which employees or which employee groups are engaging with the referral program and which aren't. Um, you know, so if your engineers are not active with the referral program, you can maybe design a campaign specific to those engineers um, to, to get them more involved and engaged. Um, if you're getting a ton of referrals, a ton of really great referrals from alumni, then that allows you to, to kind of create a strategy or redirect your strategy to, to focus on alumni. Um, but again, you won't know any of that without having access to the, to the data and without being able to measure your activities. So it really comes down to having access to that, that data, being able to measure it, and then being able to analyze it in some sort of meaningful way that, that allows you to apply it to your strategy. And then finally, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, and I think I kind of touched on it before uh, with the Tesla example, but 
the, the reality is that the, of all the referrals that you're going to get and all the referrals that you're going to gen, uh, generate over time, a small fraction of those will actually apply and a smaller fraction will actually convert into hires. So what do you do with that other pool of people? Um, you don't want to just let them sit there in your ATS if they did apply and never be able to interact or engage with them. Uh, you don't want them just going off and wondering what the heck ever happened to uh, the, the recruiting process, you know, kind of clueless as to, to why they weren't hired or why they weren't engaged. Um, what you really want to be able to do is continue to nurture those referred contacts and referred candidates over time. Um, you know, that, continuing that communication is really key, um, not just for the person who was referred, but for the employee who, who made the referral. Uh, when they can see that their activity was followed up on and that, uh, that it serves some value for the company, they're more likely to refer again in the future. Um, if they see that it just goes into some black hole and it was never followed up on or um, it never led to anything productive for the company, then they're less likely to, to be engaged. So again, being able to segment all of these contacts that you get into specific pipelines or specific um, groups within your, say, your CRM technology um, is, is key to your ability to, to start, excuse me, continue to build relationships with them and nurture them over time. That way, if it, if it comes to a point where they maybe are ready to apply or they are ready to engage, then they're going to think of your business and your brand first as opposed to um, having maybe a negative impression or, or a view of your, your company. I love that, and I totally agree that, you know, it's kind of, you know, you're trying to hit a target at the right place at the right time. So not every person that, you know, your brand interacts with is going to be the right fit maybe for the roles that you're hiring for, but if you continue to nurture those folks, um, maybe there's a path to, you know, employment down the road. Um, so keeping those lines of communication open I think is extremely important. Yep. All right, so we have about 15 minutes left, but before we get into the Q&A session, um, we're just going to go over some quick t key takeaways. Um, so the first, invest in your brand. Make sure that it's being refined over time as well. And test out whether your EVP, your employee value proposition, is coming through to employees. If they can't readily tell your, you know, kind of elevator pitch for why working at your company is great, um, that's a problem. And the second, keep it simple. Make sure that whatever process you have in place, um, that this program is easy to use, you have minimal hoops for people to jump through, and that you have a clearly defined process. Um, you need to make sure that this process for referring friends and family and acquaintances it's not so rigid that it actually deters people from doing the act of referring. Yeah, I love that. I think, I think that first point around investing in your brand is, is really, really important. It's, it's easy to kind of overlook, but um, again, going back to the idea of incentives, I think there's disproportionate emphasis placed on incentives. Um, they're important. They might drive activity. But if your employees or your referral network just generally understands your brand, who you are, what your purpose is, um, and what a referred candidate might get out of working for you or with you, that has carried so much more weight and has so much more value to the person making the referral and the person being referred than any incentive that you could offer. So the incentives, you know, icing on the cake, but I think to Mallory's point, investing in the brand is, is really key. Um, the third point here is, you know, I think I've beaten this to death on the call, but uh, building relationships through timely targeted nurture, um, you know, really it's, it's it's easy to get a referral program up and running. It's a little bit more difficult without the right technology and the right process and the right strategy to, uh, for that referral program to be effective. For that to be the case, um, I, I think really you have to be able to deliver personal communications to the right people at the right time uh, for the right goal. Um, and if, if you're just out there trying to shotgun blast and ask for referrals, you might get a few. But what you're going to end up with more than anything is, is um, that fishbowl with the business cards thrown in it um, just so somebody can get like $5 off their lunch. And, and ultimately that's not valuable to the business. It's just going to create unnecessary activity and, and effort on your team's part without um, corresponding results. So 
the more you're able to kind of target your engagement, target your communication, target your nurturing to specific groups of people and specific initiatives, um, the more effective that, that's going to be in the end. Uh, and finally, we, we just touched on this, but um, the ability to kind of measure all of your activities uh, over time and in specific channels and areas and efforts um, is really key to understanding what's working in your referral program, what's not working, um, where you should divert efforts, where you shouldn't, um, and, and ultimately how you can drive toward the results and the goal that you, you want to achieve. All right. Well, Josh and Mallory, thank you so much for this very informative presentation. I really enjoyed listening along, so thanks so much, guys. Um, thanks, with our remaining, yeah, With our remaining uh, 10 minutes or so, why don't we move right into the Q&A portion? We actually got a lot of great questions from uh, you guys, our audience, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. There were a lot of good ones in there. <laughs> I'm going to try my best. Um, and if we don't get to your question today on the call, we do like to do a wrap-up post on blog.smashfly.com post-webinar, and we'll try to answer it there. So, all right, our first question, we actually saw a lot of questions around this, um, around whether or not referral programs adversely affect diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, what would you guys say to this? I mean, are, are referral programs bad for diversity and and you know how can you strategically design a referral program to drive diversity hires yeah um i'd love to you know start things off and maybe josh can chime in um i think there's an education piece here and i i definitely see where people are coming from and what the concern is around diversity right because i think we're all thinking about referrals as referring somebody who's the same as us um, so educating your employees about what the, referral, what the purpose of the referral program is, is key. Um, what you're looking for is, is you're looking to add people who are going to bring kind of a culture add to your company. You're not looking to add more of the same. Um, and I think explaining to your workforce, like, we have to achieve X. We, diversity really drives innovation. We need different perspectives to solve our problems. So we don't, want, we don't need more of the same. We need more of you know, the people that are going to help us achieve these goals and solve the problems in front of us. So I definitely think um, that's where leadership can be really impactful, um, hearing from your CEO or other company leaders um, about this topic and, and how important it is to make sure that we're not using a very narrow lens when we're looking at referrals. I think that um, is one way that you can definitely combat um, kind of adverse effects of a referral program. And Josh, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I think you said it perfectly. I, I don't really have too much to add, but I think it's, it, it really goes back to if you, um, the correlations between consumer marketing and referral marketing um, are, are so intertwined. I think if you think about, not to use the Tesla example again, but um, Tesla doesn't necessarily want to uh, have everybody in the world refer to their business. Um, that ends up just distracting them and, and you know, filling their funnels with um, a bunch of customers who may or may not be able to afford their cars or understand their cars or whatever. Um, so with your, your referral program, it's the same way. It's exactly what Mallory just said. It's, it's really about how you message um, what your goal is for the referral program and what sort of outcome you're trying to drive toward, but also messaging the importance of diversity or whatever the initiative is, uh, initiative is that, you're, that you're really driving toward. But um, I think Mallory, you know, what she said really summed it up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for that answer. I mean, in terms of the research, I know uh, research by Undercover Recruiter shows that referrals can actually be the number one source of diversity hires. So you know, in communicating with your employee base and, and in, you know, kind of incentivizing them to act as uh, brand advocates, I think exactly what you guys said. It's important to communicate the goal. Um, yeah, and I think, so, Ali, just, to, yeah, just, just real quick, just to touch on that, if, uh, there's a great campaign by GE out there right now um, around uh, Millie Dressel House. And if you look at that, I think um, it's not explicitly asking for referrals uh, for female engineers, but it, it speaks to the, uh, the critical nature of that aspect of recruiting to GE's core business and really kind of their, 
their entire corporate mission and vision toward driving to that outcome. So if you go look at that type of campaign, I think that, that type of thing right there, or that type of um, initiative really tells or sends signals to the entire employee base or possible referral network that this is important to GE, it's driving toward this outcome, and I think implicitly uh, suggests that maybe you know, that's where it, it's trying to get referrals from. Yeah, totally. just, just one more thing to add. Sorry, I love this question, so just one more thing. Um, I think it's important to be mindful of the different, kind of the different ways that, you know, your different job groups at your company behave, too. I think certain job groups may be more inclined to participate in a referral program. So that's why getting widespread participation is important. You want kind of everyone in the organization reaching out to their networks um, so that you, you get diverse results and, and it's not just, you know, your sales team reaching out to get referrals. You want to make sure that, you know, you have buy-in from different job groups and that may require you to use different tactics to get people involved. Um, so go talk to those, you know, if you're trying to recruit for a specific role, go talk to the people in that role and find out what's important to them and kind of get to the root of what, you know, would inspire them and motivate them to get involved. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, Mallory. I, I love that point about using a variety of strategies. I think it's important to tie your um, referral program, the value, not just to those financial incentives, but also to maybe your core mission as a company. You know, I know one of the ways that, that I'm always uh, encouraged to submit referrals is because, you know, I love the company I work for, and I, I feel like th the message is, hey, you know, if you love it here and you know someone else who's going to love it here, if you know someone else who's a, a fit for our mission and, and our culture, then we want to work with them, so send them our way. You know, so I, I feel like I'm, you know, whether or not there's a bonus attached to that, I feel like I'm helping my company create the kind of culture that I personally want to work in. Um, so, yeah, great discussion. That's an amazing question. Let's try to squeeze in a couple more in our last five minutes. Um, so actually this is a great segue into if you, if you don't have the funds to purchase or pay for referral incentives, um, what are some creative ways to drive employees to still submit those referrals? Mallory, I don't know if you want to tackle this first, but I think we, we touched on this a little bit earlier on. I think it, if, the, if your core driver of referrals is or are incentives, um, and specific, or specifically financial incentives, I think you're put, you're putting yourself in a bad position because um, you're, you're going to get either volume over quality, or um, you're going to I think you're going to be incentivized, incentivizing the wrong types of behavior. So I think you can actually have a referral program without any sort of significant incentive, uh, financial incentive, um, as long as what you're doing is investing in what Mallory talked about earlier, and that's investing in, in really telling your brand story and, and kind of. Who you are, what you're trying to, or what you're, or who you are, what you want to be, who you're trying to recruit, um, anything really around um, why someone would want to work for your business, and then also I think employee engagement is a huge part of it. So if you're engaging your employee with that type of con uh, that or employees with that type of content and really um, helping them understand their impact on the business and the impact of of um, getting the right talent into the business going forward. Um, I think that will drive activity if you don't have the incentive to, to throw on top of everything. Totally. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that one, Josh. Um, people are, I think, motivated more by making a difference and making an impact than, you know, the financial side of it. So if they don't understand their role in helping the overall company meet its objectives, um, you know, they're not, they're not going to see the value in helping bring other great people to the organization. So engaging your employees, helping them understand the vision um, and how each and every one of them plays into the overall objectives of the company and, and the mission and what you're trying to achieve, um, that's the, the most important thing. As far as how you can encourage, you know, in a more like, tactical way, um, I think most things start at an organization from leaders. So if you don't have your leaders involved, I'd start there. I'd task you with meeting with um, leaders across your company and, and at the top and helping them to understand the importance of the program first. 
um, so that they can disseminate that information and motivate their teams. Um, yeah, if you don't have a ton of budget to allocate, I don't think that that's a huge problem. I think you can do it by simply just inspiring people and helping them understand their role. Yeah, love that, Mallory. And we work with a partner too who makes um, this referrals pro their referrals program actually a part of their company culture. And every month they'll have like a, a pizza night that's hosted by their sourcer team, and they'll encourage the entire company to, to come along and search their LinkedIn, search their personal networks, and hunt down people who'd be a great fit for the company. So that's one way that you can have a lot of fun together while still driving like you know cultural fits and, and uh, great referrals. Um, yeah, maybe one I mean, more question. That's a, that's a, that's a yeah. great example, and sorry, just to add, I mean, like the sky's the limit as far as how creative you can get here. I mean, people love contests. You can award the highest referrer with like, the, the option to set a company holiday or something really silly like that. Say somebody is referring a ton of candidates, ask them, do you want to have an 80s day at work, pajama day, crazy hair day, whatever they choose that's you know, appropriate for work. And you know, that day for you know, whatever date they set is, is pajama day. I mean, People are driven by things like that too, so I encourage everybody to get creative with it. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I absolutely love that. We are two minutes over now, so thank you so much to Josh and Mallory for your really informative insight on this topic. Um, I learned a lot today, and I hope everyone in the audience did as well. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and uh, you will be getting the webinar uh, recording and slides Hopefully by the end of today, um, we'll be sending those out. So t keep an eye on your email inbox for that. Anyway, thank you again to our speakers, and uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon, guys. Thanks, Allison. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Allie. Good job, Mallory. Yeah, everybody Thanks, have Josh. a good one. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, guys.